In January 2004, a significant scientific and technological accomplishment was attained. The United States National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, accomplished the Mars Exploration Rover mission. This is the result of an extreme scientific and financial commitment. Both the Spirit and Opportunity rovers have been triumphant, and profound groundbreaking knowledge of the planet's surface has been generated, including the exploration and discovery of possible water remnants. That's significant, because all life as we know it depend upon water for survival. However, this achievement is overshadowed by a profound humanitarian crisis on planet Earth. Every day, 14,000 people die because of a lack of water or from disease caused by water pollution. And 9,500 of these are children. Further, lack of safe water, sanitation and hygiene is one of the most important signs of extreme poverty. Worldwide, a child dies every 15 seconds from diarrhea. These quiet, preventable deaths hardly receive any attention. But there is hope. The UN has pledged to cut in half the number of people without access to safe drinking water and sanitation by 2015. The estimated cost is 16 billion US dollars per year. This happens to be less than Europeans and North Americans spend annually on pet food. To reach that goal, the public must know the facts and politicians must be willing to act. We are living on 1% of the world's water and most of that is used for agriculture. The other 99% of the world's water is too salty to drink or composed of icebergs and snow. Water is a very precious resource, yet we take clean water for granted in the West. But a quarter of the world's population urgently needs clean water. We, I mean, we cannot afford to run out of the resource itself when it is very central to the functioning of life itself. You know, sometimes governments have a tendency of treating the water services very trivially. And yet for me, they are the most important services central to basic human rights. So if we make sure that uh, we, we give water services, we are giving dignity to our people. By the year 2020, as many as 76 million people could die from polluted water. Most of them, children. Diarrhea, schistosomiasis, guinea worm, cholera, dysentery. Uh, those are diseases that are fundamentally associated with our failure to provide clean drinking water and sanitation services. We know how to do that, but we've failed to do it for, for a very large percentage of, our, of the world's population. It has been projected that by the approaching year 2015, nearly half of the world's population, more than three billion people, will be in environments where the pure drinking water supply is stressed. Those locations are mostly in Africa, the Middle East, South Asia, and Northern China. Also in portions of the United States, Latin America, and Australia there are severe water issues. The Earth's ecological system transcends geopolitical borders, religion, race, and ideology. And all countries must cooperate with each other to confront the problems as a top priority. Even in places where there's, there, there are long-standing hatreds and conflicts for ethnic reasons or political reasons or economic reasons or religious reasons. Parties have, are coming to the understanding that they have to cooperate over water. It should be a basic right 
that every human being is entitled to an adequate amount of good quality drinking water every day in order to survive. You see the water as a basic fundamental right and also a social good is something that was always accessible to people. But the moment we began with centralized management of this water, we forgot that each and every drop needs to be tapped. The world's population is growing fast and will grow by 50% in the next few generations. But humanity's use of water is growing even faster. In fact, twice as fast. In the future, there may not be enough water or food for that matter for everyone. So these countries face terrible challenges in feeding their people and providing clean water to their people and providing decent habitat for their people as resource scarcities occur in the countryside, they move to urban centers. How are they gonna be able to support municipal facilities that give any kind of decent uh, water treatment or uh, schooling or infrastructure in uh, urban areas? In developing countries, Children cannot get a basic education because of a round-the-clock effort to find clean drinking water. As the population changes, so will the climate. Arguments about the extent of human responsibility for global climate change will continue. But the impacts are already being seen with disruption to traditional weather patterns and increasingly severe droughts and floods in many parts of the world. Also, the effect of profound environmental disasters exemplify the global water and sanitation emergency. The humanitarian water crisis has generated geopolitical concerns within the United States intelligence services. They have predicted that within the first 15 years of this century, regional armed conflicts could evolve because of the local lack of adequate safe water. We are now in that window of time. There are, what, somewhere around 250 rivers in the world that um, run through two or more countries. And 90% of the water in the Middle East flows through two or more countries. I mean, these are very important political phenomena. And while there's lots of conflict over water within countries, what we're talking about now, the sort of interstate regional conflict potential is um, significant. In today's new world, which includes the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, rogue states and terrorists, the evolving water crisis compounds and magnifies the challenges confronting the 21st century. The seeds of terrorism evolve from the global humanitarian crisis. And you cannot overcome terror just by military means. We have to fight not only terror, but also the reasons for terror, the motives for it. You have to promise the people a better life. There are conditions that produce terrorists and extremists. Those conditions are hunger, disease, poor education and poverty. When these conditions exist, anyone who promises them a better life can easily recruit terrorists because people are ready to do crimes to improve their lives. I agree with those who say we need to fight terrorism. They are right, because international terrorism is a horrifying phenomena. But if anybody thinks that tanks, airplanes or missiles will solve the problem, they are mistaken. It is understandable that we need military measures to attack terrorist bases. 
But this doesn't solve the main problem, which are the conditions that breed terrorism. That is something that needs to be addressed. Nations fight over oil. But as valuable as it is, there are substitutes for oil. However, there are no substitutes for water. We die quickly without it. And no national leader would hesitate to battle for an adequate water supply. For sure, it will affect all of life. In areas where there is a lack of water, conflicts occur. And this is a security concern. People will do everything for water. China's population is 1.3 billion, which is confined to an area nearly the same size as the United States. China has 22% of the world's population and only 7% of the world's fresh water. Wars, turbulence and violence, which have prevailed in China during the past two centuries, have faded into a new and complicated era. China's effort to become an economic and industrial power has been at the expense of the environment. Around 700 million Chinese, half of the country's population, consume drinking water contaminated with animal and human waste. 400 major cities face water shortages. 86% of China's rivers have exceeded local pollution standards, and 70% of its cities have no sewage treatment plants. The country's leadership is facing the reality of a critical, decisive moment of truth. The water crisis in China is very serious. It is a very important issue, and it has already become a key constraint for economic and social development and sustainable development in China. Most of China's population is centered in northern China, where the water crisis is most severe. Beijing, with a population of 17 million, is experiencing a grave realization. Water quantity and quality issues have evolved to a critical mass. Both of Beijing's major water sources have significant complications. Beijing is very short of water supply. In per capita terms, the water resource is only 300 cubic meters per person. And even good water can be polluted. So our problem is that we don't have much water of good quality. Even if we improve the sources of the water pollution to reach water pollution standards, it's still substandard. Since the 1970s, the Guangting Reservoir was a major source of drinking water for Beijing. However, since 1997, it has stopped being utilized. This Guangting Reservoir was the water supply uh, source for urban and also agricultural uh, water uh, sectors. Because of the uh, pollutants, from the upstream agricultural field and from some, the, some, some industrial area. Now the, the Guantin uh, Reservoir is polluted. It is polluting in a very severe situation. As a result of the pollution problem, the major waterway from the dam to the city of Beijing is completely dry. The other significant drinking water source for Beijing is the Miyen Reservoir. There are rising concerns regarding the reservoir's deteriorating water quality. The fear is the Miyen Reservoir might face the same fate as the Guangting Reservoir. The cause of the pollution is human waste and agricultural runoff, which includes fertilizers and pesticides. 
Compounding the pollution problem is the significant drought conditions which dominates the region. The drought situation is extremely evident in both the reservoir and its major tributary. Beneath the shadow of China's Great Wall and the Yen Mountain Range lies the Chao Bai River, the major tributary of the Mi Yen Reservoir. Normally, during the rainy season, there would be a flow of water in the river. However, due to the severe drought conditions, the river has been completely dry. Within the city of Beijing, there are also significant sanitation problems. The Shiba River, an open urban sewer, flows through a slum area and out of view, but immediately adjacent to a prestigious corporate and residential community. I have a little daughter. Once we were passing by a polluted river and she said to me, Mom, you should try to clean up the river, it is too dirty. Children wish things seen by their naive eyes could be beautiful. We also have the same wish, and we hope our children could be healthy, physically and mentally. The severity of the water quality and quantity problems is not confined to the urban environment. In rural China, there is a significant humanitarian crisis. Within the northwestern region of Shanxi province, many of the inhabitants suffer from extreme poverty, lack of clean drinking water, and disease. A crippling disease which affects tens of thousands of men, women, and children is prevalent in the region. The common symptoms are disfigurement and discoloring of the teeth. It's perceived the disease is caused by the drinking water. Clearly, an in-depth analysis of the water and soil is needed. Often, children acquire the disease by drinking rainwater after it saturates the earth. Within Dingbin County, the 500 people in Wangbang village live on an equivalent of 120 US dollars per year. These farming village inhabitants dwell in sparse caves and depend on rainfall for drinking water and agriculture. August is harvest month in the region, but due to nine years of drought over the past 10 years, there is consistently a low crop yield and drinking water is almost non-existent. During the dry season, from April through June, the county transports expensive drinking water to the village from limited groundwater sources. The village must pay for the water, but it's difficult because of the extreme poverty. When there is a rare rainfall, it's a reason for rejoicing and productivity. In Shuanshang village, two-thirds of the population must rely on springs or groundwater wells, which are only accessible by walking two kilometers on treacherous and steep mountain trails. They must make the journey at least twice a day. The water is of poor quality and must be boiled before it's consumed. The majestic Yellow River is considered one of the great rivers of the world. Unfortunately, today, there is a significant lack of flow in the river because of the drought and diversion for irrigation and city industrial use. The impact has been profound. 
There is an old Chinese saying, water of the Yellow River comes from heaven and then flows into the sea never back. The scenery of the Yellow River rolling into the sea is magnificent. The Yellow River is recognized as our mother river. However, in recent years, with the development of the population, economy and agriculture in the upstream, the water consumption increases greatly. Water use in the upstream is also careless. Moreover, the Yellow River itself is short of water, and the flow is seriously drying up. The worst situation happened in 1997. For 270 days, the river dried up. The scenery of the Yellow River magnificently rolling into the sea has seldom been seen in autumn. What's worse, the ecosystem along the Yellow River has been destroyed. Shenmu County is a major industrial area and one of the top 100 richest counties in China. There is extensive coal mining and also 116 coal-fired power plants are located within the county. Water is diverted from local rivers to support the industry, but there is also a severe lack of water for drinking. In the past, there was an old Chinese saying that man can conquer nature. It shouldn't be that way. In fact, human beings always struggle with nature. In contrast, we should respect and conform to nature, and we should return nature to her real face. It's important not to fall into a trap of believing the answer to the looming water crisis lies solely in complex and expensive engineering solutions. Water resources have been exploited with little or no consideration for sustainability or to environmental consequences. The most tragic example is the Aral Sea, located within the former Soviet Union, once the world's fourth largest inland sea. In the 1950s, the Soviet Union diverted large parts of the two rivers that feed the Aral, the Amu Darya and the Sir Darya, to irrigate cotton crops in the near desert environment of Central Asia. I remember that time very well. The country wanted to produce more cotton, so water was diverted for irrigation from the two rivers, Amudarya and Tsirdarya, which were the water supply to the Aral Sea. The Aral Sea soon began to dry up, and today it's half the size it used to be. It contained 24 species of fish, which are now extinct because of increased salinity and the withdrawal of water. The salinity killed crops, and the salt in the atmosphere has impaired local people's health, increasing incidence of cancer and respiratory diseases. This is not just a regional problem. It is an example of a global ecological catastrophe. There are numerous gigantic engineering projects being considered, redirecting many of the rivers, lakes and oceans of the world. Replumbing the planet needs significant environmental evaluation. The Middle East is a microcosm of the Earth's water crisis and its centerpiece is the Jordan River Basin region, which includes Israel, the West Bank, Gaza Strip, and Jordan. It occupies an area of approximately 11,000 square miles. The cause of the crisis is both natural and man-made. We are very concerned. We have a very severe crisis today, and we are dealing in a very severe situation. We are 100% uh, of our time busy how to get out of this crisis, how to stabilize uh, the water sector in Israel. And this is our main problem today, because we are in a very shaky situation. The region continually suffers from drought conditions. There has been a significant increase in demand for water caused by population growth, which has led to overutilization of water sources 
and it is feared that shortly it may be difficult to adequately supply municipal and household water requirements. Compounding the water supply issue is localized water pollution. The Holy Land, as this region is often called, has global significance because it is a nucleus for religion. Within these environs, there is a confluence of worship for a diversity of spiritual beliefs. But constant confrontation has had a devastating effect within this area. There is no place in the world where the solutions to providing pure, clean drinking water to all citizens are more complex and challenging. Historically speaking, land is war and water is peace. You cannot change the land. You can fight for it, defend it, extend it. With water you can make policies, because water is floating, it's mobile can transfer it, which you cannot do with land. There is enough water in the Middle East, but there is not enough peace to make a good use of the water. The primary sources of water within the area are the mountain and coastal aquifers and the most consequential river in the world, the Jordan. Today, raw, untreated sewage from uncontrolled development is flowing into the Jordan. And the poor infrastructure and planning in the region causes sewage to pollute every source of water that's available to the area's nine million population. Today, conflict in the region is impacting the Kingdom of Jordan. The problem is very serious. And the roots of the water crisis that we're living uh, here in the region is due to scarcity of water resources as a result of climat climatological conditions as well as population growth rates. Population growth rates due to natural growth rates as well as uh, waves of refugees, displaced persons, returnees as a result of conflict. And all these people came to Jordan and as a result of increasing demand to supply these people with water our water resources that already overpumped became more stressed. And this is already heading toward a huge water issue that could have potential on food production, health and environmental sustainability. The projected population within the Jordan River Basin is 15 million or more by 2020. An alarming example of the crisis is the Gaza Strip, which is 146 square miles and has a population of 1,200,000. The area includes Rafa City, a Palestinian refugee camp with a population over 150,000 within approximately two square miles. Within this confining environment, there is a serious lack of water for the occupants and significant pollution. The supply of water is from the coastal aquifer and it contains large quantities of salt. Further, the area is so degenerated that human waste is flowing through the streets. Currently, in northern Gaza City, the sewage treatment facility is designed for a population of 50,000. But instead, needs to accommodate 150,000 city dwellers. The result? Recurrent raw sewage flows over the facility's banks into the city of Gaza. There are current plans to solve the sewage treatment problem and to create reliable water sources, including the building of ocean water desalination facilities on the Gaza Strip. However, Safety concerns caused by the ongoing conflict between Israel and the Palestinians have prevented their development. This has created serious environmental problems. Compounding the current dilemmas, there are also sensitive regional geopolitical issues over water. A case in point is the Wazani, a spring on the Lebanon side of the border with Israel, which flows into the Hasbani River and is a tributary to the Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee. Significant tensions have occurred between the two countries 
because Lebanon implemented a project which diverts a portion of the spring to 20 villages in South Lebanon. Israel indicated this diversion is compromising its water supply and has threatened military action. In Lebanon, the Hezbollah party also made ominous declarations over the issue. Transcending the current regional conflicts, it is widely believed by a diversity of entities that water can be a bridge to peace in the Middle East and other parts of the world. And I think that uh, the, the most important thing in order to solve the problem in this region is first of all the, the, the cooperation between the countries and second is to, to take the arguments out of the question uh, about the, uh, the existing water resources. This continuous need for water, both under violence, under fire, or under peace, it means that the two parties, the Israelis and the Palestinians, should isolate the water oceans from any negative impact from the violence, existing violence. And I think if the Palestinians and Israelis will succeed in managing the issues of water, there will, the other issues will follow them. The water problem, if we succeed in solving, refugees will follow, borders will follow, security will follow. This will lead to the same point. It is a political point and the violence should stop and peace should come. Otherwise, Every activity will collapse, water and sewage and economy and health. Africa is the second largest continent and covers one-fifth of the total land surface of the globe. It has a significant diversity of ecological experiences and has the world's fastest population growth. The current population is approximately 780 million, and 626 million live in the sub-Sahara region of Africa. North Africa is significantly barren, and the central portion has an abundance of water. Consequently, water disputes have been known to occur along the dividing line of the two regions. 40% of Africa's population is expected to suffer serious illnesses over the next decade, frequently fatal, because of water quality problems. North Africa and Sub-Sahara regions all have rapidly growing populations and depleting water supplies. Water accessibility and quality issues are prevalent throughout Africa. An example of the crisis is in the country of South Africa. It is the most urbanized nation on the continent and has made the most progress in providing clean drinking water to all of its citizens. For years, the country lived in the dark and repressive tyranny of the apartheid regime. In 1994, South Africa emerged with the creation of a democratic government and a new constitution. It specifically guarantees everyone the right to an environment that is not harmful to their health or well-being and access to sufficient food and water. We had people who were invisible in South Africa. The large majority, 70% of the population were invisible and their party. Nobody can be invisible and particularly what George Orwell called the great unwashed. Uh, everybody must have visibility and democracy, uh, and, and we must meet their legitimate needs, which we, will, which we are doing. Unfortunately, the good intentions of the new constitution have not been fully realized. In 1994, 16 million of South African citizens did not have access to clean water. A national effort has resulted in reducing the crisis significantly. However, there are still major problems. The current population is 45 million. A minimum of 18 million of its citizens do not have access to adequate sanitation 
and five million still do not have access to clean drinking water. Further, more than half of South Africans live below the poverty level. Women and children are the most powerless and vulnerable. When there's underdevelopment, mainly that's where you'll find poverty. And the majority of those people are women whose men migrate to the urban areas uh, seeking for, for employment because they are at the cold face of poverty. They are vulnerable to diseases. But deaths, mortality rate amongst children is the highest. Pockets of poverty are prevalent throughout South Africa. This can be visualized in the squatter camps. A vivid example is the squatter camp in Cape Town. Thousands of people live within this one square kilometer area in single-story shacks. Typically, between six and 12 people share one shack. Within this environment, conditions are so bleak that accidental fires occur frequently. There is a lack of sanitation and access to drinking water. There are a limited number of standpipes available for the entire camp. The water is frequently contaminated because of poor sanitation conditions and improper hygiene. Sanitation consists of bucket system toilets, which are adjacent to an open sewer. Typhoid and hepatitis are widespread among dwellers. We could uh, give access to these water services, but without people being aware that hygiene is important, you will still encounter problems. In one area that I visited, uh, where there was an, an outbreak of cholera, we, 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 we found out that uh, the houses that were affected have got clean water, they have flush uh, toilet systems. So it was not necessarily because of uh, the lack of water services that uh, those people were affected, but mainly it was ignorance about hygiene. 75% of those who live a poverty existence in South Africa are within the rural areas. Access to piped water is limited within these remote environs. In the Mapumalanga province, the Megwe stream flows through the village of Lihawa. The stream is heavily polluted from groundwater contamination caused primarily by the flow of human waste from numerous pit latrines, which have been badly positioned within the drainage basin. The waste flows into the stream, causing waterborne diseases such as cholera, diarrhea, and malaria from the mosquitoes which thrive when the temperature rises. The stream also flows adjacent to the Mamizna Primary School. Often the school runs out of its supply of drinking water and a number of the 1,000 children within the school will drink directly from the stream. Also, frequently, women from the village draw their drinking water from the stream. Unfortunately, this village is one of many which have similar issues. At the headwater of the Yaxi River in urban Johannesburg, it becomes polluted by urban runoff, which includes drainage from overfilled toilets. Within the Alexandra Township, there have been serious outbreaks of cholera among people who drink from the river. A little further downstream, industrial drainage from mining operations, as well as toxic and solid waste disposal areas, agriculture runoff, and discharge from 32 sewage treatment plants drain into the river. They generate significant phosphate buildup and algae growth within the river system, 
which eliminates oxygen in the water and consequently cannot support life. The river ultimately flows into the Hartabispoor Reservoir. It's the most polluted reservoir in all of Africa. Downstream from the reservoir, many inhabitants utilize the river water for drinking purposes, which undermines their health and well-being. The lack of water, of course, has a huge uh, effect on child health care. Uh, we mustn't forget that, that if you, the water provisioning will lead to immediately to an improvement uh, in uh, the health of children uh, and, of course, very important, uh, the lifespan uh, of people in Africa. The challenge is uh, the whole issue of uh, water availability. In Africa, we have quite a lot of water, but it's not always where we need it. We have a huge amount of water in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, for example. Uh, enough to supply the entire continent, but it's far away, and we have a crisis uh, close by. Bring in on top of this the unknown impacts of things like HIV/AIDS. It's been estimated that six to ten million of the population have the virus, and the health of the victims is being undermined by the water quantity and quality problems in the country. Obviously, it will have a detrimental effect on the anti-retroviral program in South Africa. The virus also has an effect on the capability of the citizens to manage the water crisis. One could speculate that many of those with the disease could have potentially been the future leaders of South Africa or would have provided technical expertise in solving the crisis. Overcoming the water and health crisis is requiring significant attention. Southern Asia is currently residing on a slippery slope. One-fifth of the world's population and nearly half of the world's poor live in Southern Asia. A conservative estimate suggests the South Asian population could grow from the current 1.4 billion to 1.8 billion by 2010. This population explosion, in concert with severe water quality, quantity and sanitation problems, has created an overwhelming challenge to the region. Southern Asia has the world's highest level of human deprivation. 260 million people lack basic health care. 337 million are without safe drinking water. 830 million are without rudimentary sanitation. And 400 million people go hungry every day. According to the United Nations World Water Development Report, India is rated as low as 120 out of 122 listed countries with poor water quality. There couldn't be any greater obstacle to overcome within the spectrum of the global water crisis than what is confronting India. The country roughly accounts for 2.5% of the Earth's land mass. 4.5% of its fresh water resources and 16% of the world's population. And it continues to grow. Yes, growing, growing at a very, very fast, rapid pace. And I don't know, I have absolutely no clue as, as to where this is going to lead to. We'll have probably people dropping off the globe, as one cartoonist put it. You'll have people dropping from all sides of the globe. Water in India has always been considered fundamental and sacred. It's used for bathing, washing clothes, obtaining sustenance, spirituality, and for leisure. However, in both urban and rural areas of India, there is widespread water contamination and excessive bacterial pollution. A profound example is the conditions on the hallowed Genga River. 
Currently, every day, 114 cities, each with a population of more than 50,000, dump untreated sewage into the river. In the Dulai district, this open sewer flows through the Dendai Cha village, which demonstrates the pollution problems which prevails in rural India. The sewer connects with the stream that is used by the village. Because of the droughts, poverty, lack of water, and degradation, there has been massive migration from rural territories in India to urban areas. These migrants dream of job opportunities and a better life, but instead, they're consumed with a living nightmare. Within the city of Bangalore, over one million of the city's population is categorized as urban poor, and nearly 700,000 as slum dwellers. There are 364 formal poverty settlements in Bangalore, and more than 360 additional settlements which are considered informal. The average density of these settlements is 300 houses with a population of 2,000 dwellers, which occupy one square kilometer. Within this urban squalor, there is a critical lack of clean water and sanitation. Consequently, there is a high mortality rate among children. India's garden city of Bengala is considered the country's most cultured urban center. It has the fastest growing population of any city in Southern Asia. The city's population now exceeds 6 million and is experiencing a growth rate of 5% every year. Now, if the city continues to grow at the rate at which it has in the past decade and the decade before that, I'm sure we will have a lot of problems unless we are in a position to recycle the water in a very big way. Uh, we have about eight urban local bodies around Bangalore. They are the growth centers because Bangalore is fully choked up now. There's hardly any potential for further growth. Now, these eight urban local bodies which are around Bangalore, they are going to be attracting a lot of development, a lot of growth, both in terms of manpower and in terms of resources in the years to come. Unless we are in a position to provide the required infrastructure, both for water and the underground drainage facilities, I'm sure the problems are going to multiply manifold. Only 35% of the city receives water on a daily basis. The remainder on alternate days. Moreover, 40% of the city is not covered by underground drainage systems, which implies sewage goes untreated. A large settlement located on the outskirts of Bengala has severe problems. It has 1,200 houses with a population of 7,000 within one square kilometer. The community must rely on groundwater, which is contaminated. As a result, pestilence is prevalent. Uh, we have a community over here which is deprived of uh, basic amenities, both water supply and uh, sanitary facilities. Sanitation is a very, very big uh, problem here. You can see that there is absolutely no sanitation arrangement. This toilet is probably discharging directly into this open drain. Uh, and every home has a toilet and we have probably um, a number of toilets along this route which directly discharge into drains like this. And these are clean, uh, cleaned by the municipality maybe uh, just once in a while. So all the time there is a lot of uh, dirt, there is a lot of uh, waste in all these surface drains. And over the past few years, groundwater has reached such a depth that even when you dig 850 feet, you're still not sure of getting water. And the water in every, in all possibility is uh, contaminated because there is no proper underground drainage system here. 
so fecal matter may get into the ground water and there is every likelihood that people may be drinking this contaminated water and uh, th we have uh, diseases which are mo mostly associated with uh, our water water infections most common amongst them is the diarrheal diseases the diarrheal diseases we have dysentery cholera then uh, we have bacterial infections these are most likely to be found here also typhoid our focus needs to be uh, you know very clear and uh, driven just by uh, by the fact that people are living in such uh, inhuman conditions and we must do whatever is needed in the least possible time as quickly as possible The United States is not exempt from the global water crisis. In contrast to the developing world, however, it's not caused by a lack of access, but by overconsumption and misuse of this sacred resource. The American public in particular, but I think this is true of, of many developed nations, takes for granted the water that they get. Um, the vast majority of Americans turns on their tap, beautiful crystal clear water comes out, and they drink it without a second's thought. And, and that's a luxury that not everybody in this world has, unfortunately. Along with that uh, comes a little bit of a disconnect about where that water comes from, how it gets to them, um, how it's treated when it gets there, and what happens to it when it leaves their house. There is a lack of understanding. There's also an expectation that the water is plentiful, that it will always come, and that it will be inexpensive. As everyone knows, the U.S. is a major guzzler of water. Uh, compared to any other country in the world, the per capita usage of water is the highest in the U.S. I think across the United States, problems are serious. Well, the problem with water is everybody needs it. Every sector in society depends on it. Our ecosystems depend on it. Our farmers depend on it. And every individual in the country depends on it. So what you have in any water situation is our competing interests for the same water. And what we found really since our populations have, have grown across the country, we just don't have enough water for everybody anymore. Today, the average American uses over 100 gallons of water a day, more than 15 times that used by most people in developing countries. They use almost twice as much water as Australia and eight times as much as Britain. The current US population is 295 million, with an annual population increase of 1.2% or 3 million people. Unless a dramatic change in behavior occurs, water resources in the United States will become scarce. Um, Americans, this country as a whole, we use water more than any other country on, on the globe. Um, we're large consumers of energy, we're large consumers of water. Our pioneer days are over. You know, it's kind of like being a teenager. It's time to grow up and it's time to become more conscious and more frugal in how we use our water. We gotta knock it off. On the East Coast, there just isn't enough water for every need. There are conflicts over water supply between New York City and upstate New York because the area is being encroached by development. In the southeast, there are upstream and downstream conflicts between the city of Atlanta and the downstream farming communities in Alabama. The reality is that Atlanta is growing and now has to implement a real-world planning policy regarding the fact that there are limits on growth if the downstream agriculture community is to survive. In southern Florida, the ecology of the delicate Everglades ecosystem has been significantly altered by irrigation engineering and urban intrusion. Also, many of the rivers on the east coast of the United States historically have had serious pollution problems. In the American Southwest, population growth has significantly outstripped the capability to store water. 
Filling swimming pools, car washing, and watering lawns may soon be a luxury of the past. I think the, the real message is we can't keep doing things the way we've always done it. We can't get water to everybody that needs it. We can't keep growing crops inefficiently. We can't keep uh, building industry everywhere we want it. And we can't keep growing our lifestyles in a way that, that uses water uh, in greater and greater volumes. That's, that's the critical message. All that means is that we have to start treating water the way we should have been treating it from the beginning, as a scarce, limited resource. In the late 19th century, when the American West was being settled, much of the land was desert or semi-desert. But instead of the settlers adapting to their new environment, the government subdued the land by building a series of gigantic dams and water diversion projects, and siphoned water from the Colorado and other rivers, and also tapped groundwater resources in order to make the way for significant urban development. The result was a profound alteration of the ecology, which has included degrading or destroying much of California wetlands. In Southern California, as much as 95% of the original wetlands are gone. Throughout the 20th and into the 21st century, the thirst for water has increased significantly. Within the American Southwest, there is no greater example of altering the ecological system than what's occurred along the lower reaches of the Colorado River. I mean, if you've ever traveled the whole basin, the natural stunning beauty of the upper basin and the tributaries to the Colorado is breathtaking. When you leave Hoover and you start traveling downstream into California and into uh, Arizona, it is the most artificial plumbing system you've ever seen. It has no more relevance to a, a natural river than, you know, a sump does. The Colorado River tumbles over 1,400 miles and travels through the southwestern U.S. and Mexico before it theoretically reaches the Sea of Cortez. The river, the prime water source for Southern California, is so completely tapped by seven states that it rarely reaches the sea. The states continue to argue about how they are going to allocate the river's yield. Also, Mexico and the United States are to share the Colorado. The U.S. and Mexico have a treaty on the Colorado River sharing the waters of the Colorado, but there was no provision in that treaty made for the natural environment. And the delta at the mouth of the Colorado in Mexico now gets no water on an average year. Uh, only when there's tremendous flood flows does any trickle of water get down to the delta. And that used to be an incredibly rich ecosystem, and it's drying up because we have not agreed to protect it because all we've cared about is water for human uses, not for environmental uses. The river is overused because of the evolving demand, and there seems to be no end in the continuous drain of the resource. This is occurring because of the lack of planning within the Colorado River watershed. The proper way to manage a watershed is as a whole. A watershed means uh, an area where water falls as rain and it f runs off in a river. Uh, but we don't draw our political boundaries based on watershed boundaries. It, it's too bad, but we don't. And we don't manage our watersheds that way as well. And that leads to political conflicts and economic conflicts and social conflicts. Las Vegas, Nevada's population growth is significant. It is the fastest growing metropolitan area in the United States, with a population exceeding 1.6 million. Currently, it's adding 5,000 new residences a month. It draws 98% of its water from the Colorado. Well, nobody ever expected Las Vegas to be created. Um, nobody ever expected Las Vegas to become what it is today. Nobody envisioned the emergence of cities to the extent that they've emerged today. And for the last 50 years, people have been moving to the Southwest in defiance of the environment that they're moving into. 
and they have tried to recreate the environment from whence they came. So you have a lot of vegetation being planted that doesn't belong in a desert. I mean, it would be tantamount to trying to walk down the streets of Anchorage in a bikini in the month of March. I mean, it makes just about as much sense. Phoenix and Tucson in Arizona, and Los Angeles and San Diego in California continue to grow. The result is demand for more and more water. California's current water use is unsustainable on an annual basis. In many areas, groundwater is being used at a rate that exceeds its natural replenishment. To complicate the issue even more is the reality of a relentless drought, which is worsening across most of the West. Numerous examples of low water levels are evident within the desert southwest and the Colorado River Basin. Water supplies are also being contaminated by both man-made and natural hazardous substances, including industrial waste, pesticides, urban runoff and microscopic organisms. The greatest threat is runoff from agricultural fields, construction sites, city streets, and abandoned mines. Controlling development is difficult because strong regulatory measures and political will is significantly lacking in order to combat ecological threats. We have engineered our way out of nature. That's the way they, the last generation felt about it. When you build those monoliths Glen Canyon Dam and Hoover Dam, and you create artificial lakes like Powell and Mead, your sense of overcoming and, you know, containing and managing Mother Nature becomes enormous. And so we've been so successful in forcing Mother Nature to do what we want that we've lost respect for it. There is no greater issue confronting the world than the water scarcity and quality crisis. Generally speaking, contaminated water is a matter of life and death. 80% of infectious diseases are caused by using impure water, and these diseases kill people, especially children. So we must think of how we should treat nature. It is really a matter of everyone's concern. We were careless in the past, and that must be left behind. We used to think that our natural resources had no limit. No, we were wrong. Resources do have a limit, and we have to change our approach. The bell tolls for us for each of us. Most of the water crisis issues can be solved by a coordinated, global, environmentally sensitive, humanitarian effort. The implementation process can be established by using affordable and practical solutions. It costs less than $25 to provide someone with a lasting supply of clean water and sanitation. All over the world, there are examples to show the strength and sustainability of community-led projects. It is possible to build on their success to make safe water and sanitation available to millions more, but this requires political will. Many organizations may have a role to play in scaling up the solutions. The public, non-governmental organizations, or NGOs, and other stakeholders, including the private sector, are all looking for innovative ways to work together effectively. But the essential element is leadership from the public sector. And of course, the public sector would need a lot of support from the private sector, from NGOs, from communities themselves. 
and unless and until the communities are a part of their own development, I don't think we could achieve anything. Comprehensive environmental land use planning is rare in deciding public works projects and overall water decision making. But it's essential in order to assure rational and decisive determinations on ecological issues. I think the importance of looking at water resources both as a limited resource but also as part of a system is really important. I think historically we've looked at, at water in a very segmented way. There was agriculture water, there's urban water, there was... And I think what we need to do and where planning gives us the tools to do it is to remind ourselves that water is part of a system. Within every watershed there's a very defined area where everything is connected to everything else. Water connects everything in the world to everything else in the world. And so we need to be thinking in terms of systems thinking, in terms of problem sheds, if you will, or in terms of, of uh, eco sheds, or in terms of, of water sheds, to be thinking about how all these problems relate to each other. All land use decisions should be made within the context of the world's ecological systems and solid environmental land use planning. For example, wetlands are significant and must be preserved and not be polluted, drained, altered or removed for any short-sighted development or project. Wetlands, in all their forms, involving marshes, rivers, lakes, estuaries, swamps and peatlands, perform a spectrum of important tasks and provide humans with life-sustaining elements. Wetlands function in reducing floods, replenishing groundwater, controlling erosion, purifying water, retaining sediment, regulating stream flow, and preventing disease. We have found that, for example, when the wetlands uh, were cleared for various reasons, uh, then you had uh, cholera, because the wetlands were like sponges, taking away all the pollution. And when they became dry land, the water stayed stagnant, and you had cholera. You had more malaria as a result, too. So it's absolutely vital to a physical planning. There's no doubt about that. Depletion of groundwater and aquifers worldwide is a very serious problem. Consequently, replenishing these precious resources is vital. And what we're now seeing in Southern Africa is that we are thinking about, and indeed we are researching and implementing these things, what is known as groundwater reef charge. This is a situation where you take water and you inject it down a well or a borehole into the ground, into a confined aquifer, and instead of having that water exposed to the atmosphere where it's lost to evaporation, you're now storing a known volume of water of a known quantity, or of a known quality, and you can retrieve that when you need it. Rainwater harvesting is also essential. A significant amount of water needs could be met worldwide through conserving maximum rainwater and recharging groundwater. In India, a major amount of precipitation occurs all over the country in a matter of a few days during the year, identified as the monsoon seasons. In Rajasthan, 1,500 villages with populations of 1,000 to 1,500 obtain clean drinking water as a result of a community-wide project. It involves finding and reopening natural underground storage areas or creating new ones. Furthermore, they build rainwater collection reservoirs that recharge water into the groundwater systems. The excess water is used for irrigation and other domestic purposes. The structures also offer protection from floods. As a result, the villages have escaped the effects of a five-year drought and have year-round drinking water.
Rainwater harvesting can also be used in big cities by building and maintaining water tanks and other structures. New York City receives yearly the same rainfall as New Delhi, India. Every community and structure on the planet has the capacity to harvest rainwater for non-potable uses, which do not require treatment. Consequently, the issue is not the amount of rainfall at one time, but the annual distribution of rainfall. In urban areas, a significant amount of drinking water can be saved through a comprehensive water efficiency program. This would include leakage control on water mains. There is new technology which can identify leaks in the water systems. In the developing world, many cities lose as much as half its water in this manner. Water savings will occur by improving the urban water structure and using modern techniques and technology. Innovative research should be encouraged and shared throughout all sectors of the global community. Water reclamation and reusing tertiary treated domestic wastewater for industry and crop production should be promoted as cost-effective and environmentally sensitive methods of solving the crisis. Today, there are many new ideas all over the world regarding water management, water production, water recycling, water reclamation, and so on. I think it's important that we make good use of this idea. I would, be, I would believe, certainly believe, that any country, every, any city, as long as they're committed to make every drop count, every dollar count, and every idea count, I believe that this water challenge all over the world can be overcome. In Singapore, drinking water is recycled from residential sewage. The project was implemented in order to make the country more self-sufficient. The project is under the management of Singapore's leadership. There are similar systems elsewhere in the world, but this is a clear example of political will implemented in order to solve a national water issue. No problem is insurmountable. In fact, every problem, there is a solution. The question is whether we're able to harness the joint ownership, the collective ownership of the whole country, the whole community. And I would say that New Water is an excellent example of how the nation, all the way from Prime Minister to the main the street, how we're able to work together as one united people to overcome uh, this, uh, this uh, water challenge. And I believe, I believe that all over the world, every city, every country, as long as they're able to work together, we can truly overcome this water divide as a global community, so that hopefully all this projection, all this prediction about a growing number of people all over the world facing water shortage in the future, hopefully it will not come true. Globally, more than twice as much water is used for agriculture than any other purpose. Further, the need to feed the growing population will compound the demand. Consequently, much more water-efficient techniques need to be implemented. In the agricultural community, drip irrigation systems, efficient sprinklers, lining canals, better irrigation schedules, recycling farm runoff and selling the saved water to urban areas and reusing treated domestic wastewater for crop production will make the industry more water efficient. Also, the agricultural industry should focus on less water-intensive crops in order to conserve the sacred resource. Equally important is education. Citizens throughout the world need to comprehend the significance of the issue and how they can participate in solving the crisis. First of all, education. To be aware of what are the problems. And then clearly clean water can be a great contribution. You need, if I would have the control of the money, in the world, I would invest it in two things, education and irrigation. 
particularly far-reaching is the importance of sanitation and hygiene promotion in impoverished areas of the world. We have a campaign called the WASH campaign, which seeks to educate everybody, especially children in the schools. And we are intending to intensify that campaign so that all of us uh, are aware that, uh, become aware that it is important for us to, to always uh, keep this good hygiene so that we, we can avoid uh, contamination of, of diseases. It is crucial that solutions and agreements on solving the problem evolve. As a result, trust will grow among all people of the world and a new global ethic will become a reality on the planet. You know, in life you have two sorts of problems. One is our problems that are insolvable, so they're not problems. The others are problems which are solvable. Water belongs to the solvable problem. So we must feel responsible to meet the challenge and provide answers. As citizens of the global community, we are the caretakers for maintaining the integrity of the Earth's ecological system. Our individual mission should be to pass along to future generations a healthy and sound environment. When we have to save the children, they are the future. We need to, 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 to make sure that all our resources uh, we expand them in, in saving the children. We must try, all of us, everywhere in the world, we need to save the children. They are the future.